Hello and welcome to the next lesson, the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I am your host, Will Roosh. Um, today, I have the director of the Positive Psychology Institute, consultant, speaker, professor, Dr. Nick Holton is going to be here and we're going to talk about um, the psychological side of everything that we're going through with COVID-19, the quarantine, um, just the really just society being kind of flipped on its ear a little bit and uh, hopefully get some good strategies to help those of you out there. I've had people reach out telling me that they have a lot of anxiety and they don't really know what to do with themselves and their mind's playing tricks on them and stuff like that. So I'm trying to get as many um, experts as I can um, on the show to try and just see if something resonates with you. So um, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Can you just introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Tell us who you are, kind of what your background is and stuff like that. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, so, so as you mentioned, I'm a psychologist and primarily I work at an independent school uh, out here in Los Angeles, California. And uh, outside of that, I do a lot of work with NCAA athletic teams, a little bit with some uh, uh, professional um, basketball franchises, um, and CEOs, high level performers, basically anyone who's interested in sort of, I think, trying to actualize greater potentials. And, and so what that means for me is studying a lot of science that focuses kind of on two primary areas, uh, well-being and performance. And when we can kind of fuse those things together and, and build them symbiotically, we get a little closer to what we call uh, thriving or flourishing. Um, not just feeling good or joyous, but like functioning on a really high level, kind of, kind of crushing it, right? Yeah. You know, when, when people hear positive psychology, I think one of the first things that come to mind is like, you know, Oprah's like the secret that if you just think, think good, then good things will happen. And I think it's probably more complicated than that. So can you maybe bring us into just like, I, it's, it's obviously very complex, but just kind of the science a little bit behind what is positive psychology? Like, what, what is really like at the base of of why that is something legitimate and not just be optimistic. It's not just being optimistic. So let's, let's talk about the name first, right? Okay. Cause I think just about anyone in the field, I think everyone agrees uh, they don't necessarily like the name. Okay. In part because it imparts uh, sort of that like hokey sense that you just alluded to a yeah, little bit, yeah. right? Kind of like happyology piece. So here's the simplest way of, of kind of, of framing things, right? When you think about um, actualizing human potential, when you think about happiness and satisfaction, well-being, and like some of, some of these good things in life, right? There's a couple of different ways of thinking about getting to those. Historically, psychology as a field has studied sort of one way, which is fixing the bad. Okay, taking, in the words of Dr. Martin Seligman, who's considered kind of the godfather of the field, um, taking somebody who is miserable and helping them be less miserable. Okay, that is a beautiful thing, and we've got all sorts of practices and studies and science that are creating all sorts of positive outcomes for a lot of people, right? And at the same time, it is one approach. So where positive psych comes in is a little bit more from the angle of build the good rather than fix the bad. And it's, it's an empirical study of happiness, life satisfaction, uh, and those words I mentioned earlier, flourishing and thriving. Okay? Now to the second part of your question, right, which is, is it just positive thinking? Well, we'll talk, you know, hopefully we'll have some time to talk a little bit about this, you know, about sort of kind of cognitive behavior um, approaches to sort of retraining the brain, cognitive reappraisal, different ways of looking at things. So that, you know, there are elements there that are really, really interesting and, and legitimate science. Uh, but the first thing I try to make anybody aware who attends one of my talks or takes one of my classes is um, that the first component of thriving, empirically speaking, if you use the model from the University of Pennsylvania, the PERMA-V model, the first component, that P, stands for positive and negative emotions, right? Meaning it's not just everything's happy-go-lucky all the time, right? When we talk about thriving, and I think, I think most people know this implicitly, um, we don't get to our greatest potentials without growth, right? And growth typically comes from challenge, 
It comes from failure. It comes from mistakes. It comes from not only building and savoring good things, but enduring unpleasant things, right? And being able to sort of come out the other end bigger and better and stronger, right? But there's another layer to that too. And I was, I was just talking to one of my students about this earlier. She said to me, and this was just maybe an hour or so ago, she said, Dr. Holden, it really kind of sucks um, you know, that we can't just always say yes to the pleasant stuff. And my response to her was, if you always could say yes to the pleasant stuff, eventually it would cease to be pleasant. It would cease to be a reward because we would just get used to having everything we wanted, right? So there's something to be said for uh, experiencing the bad and developing what psychologists call distress tolerance, right? And the ability to sort of navigate and, and be flexible in difficult situations. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's a great thing to, to discuss because look at society now. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because this is something that comes up in the podcast a lot. And I want to get your thoughts on it. Um, if you look at like modern American society up before like March of this year and COVID is, you know, things have never been better, essentially, as far as like air conditioning in homes and, you know, diseases and violence, you know, Steven Pinker's book about how worldwide violence is down everywhere from spanking kids to global war, all this stuff. But what has been getting worse are things like opioid overdoses, suicides, mass shootings, depression. It's strange how if you took someone from 300 years ago, you popped them down here today, they'd look in refrigerators and grocery stores. They'd be like, this is so incredible. Oh my gosh, amazing. And then we have gotten almost so used to that good, as you're saying, that our, 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 is it that our minds are kind of like rejecting because we don't have enough struggle to survive. So now we're finding struggle in other areas or, or how, how is, those have got to be related in some way. What is your take on that? Oh man, there's, there's so much to unpack here, right? Yeah. But, but you're absolutely right. So in many ways, life has never been better. And in many ways, people have never been more miserable. Right. Especially in these sort of quote unquote, um, well, I should, it's not even really reserved just for the Western world, right? But for, for, for the modern world in particular, there's some specific pressures and sort of cultural values and attitudes um, and some, some big systemic forces, right? Kind, kind of working against us uh, psychologically in many ways. Um, so where to start? <laughs> If, if you look at what a lot of people sort of equate to happiness, and, and here's where I'll mention a terrific book uh, called The Myths of Happiness by Dr. Sonia Lear-Bormirsky, a, a terrific psychologist out of UC Riverside. And she lays all of this out in detail, but let, let's just, let's put it very simply that there are a lot of folks who put a lot of their happiness on material goods, okay? That's, that's a losing proposition, okay? There are also a lot of folks who put their happiness upon one person. Can I, um, yeah, I, I wanna come back to it, but can I cut you off there for a second? Because sure. uh, it's, this is, when you focus on material goods, like material goods are awesome. You know, like how do you, like we all kind of know that, like, you know, money can't buy happiness or don't, don't focus on material goods, but Material goods are pretty sweet. I like the new iPhone. I want the new stuff. I love, you know, sports cars or whatever it is, or even just like new jewelry or a cool shirt. Like that is like, we know that, or a lot of us know that, but it's, it's, how do we shift in thinking that though? Like, like saying no to that. I love chocolate cake, but like, nope, no chocolate cake, you know? Yeah. So Again, a couple things to unpack there, but so so let me mention this. So we mentioned the material goods item, right? Yeah. But you can think about uh, the same phenomenon with people and with goals, okay? So material goods, people, and goals, three things that tend to make us very happy, and they do, right? And in fact, money does buy happiness. Yeah. Uh, money correlates very significantly with happiness to a point, and I'll get to that in just a second, okay? Yeah. And that's, that's the critical nuance. Mm -hmm. But when you think about people, material goods, and goals, okay, we acquire these things, they come into our lives, they have a sense of novelty and newness, they give us floods of dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin, these very happy chemicals, okay, they give us positive emotions, 
and then we habituate these things. Okay? It's a phenomenon called hedonic adaptation. We get used to the things that bring us both pl uh, pleasant and unpleasant emotions and feelings. Okay? This is very advantageous for us when you know we get dumped or we're uh, you know we're kind of down in the gutter and we need to bounce back. But to my students point earlier, it kind of stinks, right? That not only can we not always say yes to everything we want, but we also get used to the things that make us happy. Okay? So when we rely on some of these things, these, this acquisition mentality, this grass is greener mentality, what we end up kind of doing is chasing our own tails. Okay? We acquire something that might give us a temporary boost, but we're going to quickly adapt to. Now where positive psych comes in is we know some other specific uh, exercises and activities and interventions that can sort of help build and maintain longer lasting happiness and well-being, right? One of the most famous at this point, most notable is the gratitude journal, right? Which a lot of people have heard about. Yeah. And I can go into detail at some point, but, but just think about it in the context of this conversation, right? Um, a lot of times chasing material goods and new people and novelty, right? And fun foods and the new iPhone and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, that's, right? and it's important to understand that that's a part of, of human nature, right? It is not in our interest to be so relaxed and satisfied that we don't acquire more. That's a threat, historically, evolutionary speaking, to survival, right? You have to strive, so, right? Yeah. To strive. The flower yeah. has to go up to the sun, has to reach for something. Right, right. right. We are never satisfied, yeah. right? We are never satisfied. But the different, there are differences between satisfaction and happiness, especially when it comes to life satisfaction, right? So when you think about this, this chase for people and goals and materials, right? This grass is greener attitude. Well, gratitude is almost the opposite of that. It's stopping and saying, what I have is good. What I have is maybe not enough. I'm not like fully satisfied. I, I have additional goals, right? I'd like to deepen relationships. Maybe I do want to be able to acquire that neat thing that has a lot of meaning for me, right? But I have enough to be well, right? And I have enough to sit here and savor what I, what I do have and experience those positive emotions and not just always have to chase and get the next newest, biggest, brightest thing, right? Yeah, yeah, and, that's, and we have a system that is so built on that. I mean, when, we, when the, taking this into COVID a little bit, like when everything did shut down, you know, you realize like how much of your life and our American society is just consumption oriented. Like it's just, we're constantly consuming, just going out and getting stuff, getting stuff, getting stuff, you know, whatever it is. And you're never going to be satisfied. I mean, that's the, one of the core ideas of like Buddhism is like, you know, it's that want, the desire to just want everything. And I actually heard um, Dan Bilzerian, that crazy like playboy type guy on Instagram talking about how he's actually gotten a Buddhist type of idea through the opposite, where he doesn't really want for things and they've lost their meaning so much. Like, so you can almost get it, get this like enlightenment essentially from giving up the desire or from just getting so much that you don't desire things anymore. They don't have meaning anymore. You get a Lamborghini, it's like, I already have a Lamborghini, you know, whatever that is. Um, well, so, so part of that phenomenon, and it's interesting brings that up, and I don't know that there's a direct connection here, but I'll, I'll refer to a study brought up, and uh, I, I can't remember the, the specific book at this point. It, it, may have been, uh, it may have been Sonia's as well, but a study of monkeys where they were basically, these monkeys had to do this task, they get rewarded with spinach. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> You've probably seen this, right? It's the like same Ron, I think it's Franz de Wall, where they're given like different grapes or whatever, right? That yeah, yeah. Well, there's that one too. So that's the inequality piece, right. Right? which I actually show in another class that okay. I teach. This is slightly different. Okay. So they were getting spinach, um, and that was giving them shots of dopamine, this happy reward chemical, okay. right? Well, when the researchers introduced lemon juice, the monkeys got a spike in the dopamine reward, okay? But remember what I said about hedonic adaptation. So as they continued to get the lemon juice reward, that reward lessened each time and to the point where it wasn't really a reward anymore, right? So we get used to these things that sort of satisfy us. And that might be what he was speaking to, is that he's just had so much 
reward that it's to to be rewarding yeah like i think about this with um with like um eating habits or something like that like i talk to kids who are trying to or adults who are trying to like eat better and they say like but i just love sweets and i say like you know disneyland is a good example like disneyland is awesome but how awesome would it be if you go every week or right. like i you know with my kids like we kind of hold off on sugar a little bit but i'm not completely like if they want to go out and get ice cream maybe like once a month or something like we're getting ice cream and then we eat it and it's like a special occasion and it tastes so good because it's so special you have it every night it loses that specialness and and yep. you know you actually probably enjoy the ice cream more because it's special that's that phenomenon, right? Yeah. And and also coming sort of full circle. That's what it, you know. I mentioned earlier this sort of like this willingness to ha to self regulate, to have some discipline and control, to not always say yes. That actually can lead to more enhanced experiences, yeah. right? Yeah. We're not constantly habituating, right? Yeah. This stuff is so fascinating. I mean, do you just do you just love psychology? Like you could just just this kind of stuff. You just love learning about it. You just can't get it. it. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this is this is it. This is what I do now. I mean, the you know, like a, you know, I'm in a fortunate enough position, um, being the age I am and not having kids, that the quarantine has been a, a little more relaxed for me than it has yeah. for some, right? As you said earlier, it's been really, really rough for some folks, and and obviously, um, you know, I want to be sensitive to that, but it's 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 ha it's provided me with some free time and uh you know this is i like i like listening to podcasts reading everything i can getting my hands on studies and books and, and videos and whatever and uh you know maybe towards the end of this we'll talk some resources some things people can check out too that might help give some guidance uh in this time but yeah like you said it's, it's just fascinating right it's just these little tips and tricks that kind of help people and unlock uh you know what i would say is i, I always kind of tell people is i think the the world's greatest resource, which is human potential and ingenuity, right? Yeah, so so getting into um, some specific things, for the people out there, there are people listening to this who are just re really feeling anxious. And it makes sense, because I don't remember a time of this much uncertainty. You know, I'm 37, and you know, I mean, I've talked to people who are older than me, and that's like, this is a very uncertain time, because news media is unreliable, um, what's the economics going to look like? What are the health, you know, uh, consequences going to look like? So much uncertainty and anxiety to some degree. I've heard it kind of described as like a fear of the future or something. I mean, people's anxiety is spiking right now. And I'm having people reach out to me saying like, I'm really struggling. Like if we, we know this stuff or you can learn this stuff, all these things that you're saying, and I, I'm fascinated by it and I try to apply it to my life. But how do we, how do we adapt? start to adopt and assimilate to um, some of these, I don't know if assimilate's the right word, but like, um, to, you know, um, bring these ideas into your world. How do you, do you have some like, just like small steps that people can do? Like if someone's trying to get in shape and they're very obese, they say like, just walk around the block. Just start by just walking around the block. So what can we do for like, what's walking around the block kind of mentally for the people that are really struggling? Well, you know, obviously there's a lot of directions we could go with that, but I'll, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind is maybe kind of the simplest tool. And it starts from this kind of fundamental empirical fact, which is emotions and feelings uh, tend to not just exist sort of a priori, <clears throat> they have to be triggered, they have to be cued, and they are often cued by beliefs. Okay. They're uh, cued by the way we are looking at things, by our perspectives. <clears throat> okay. So sometimes the way to counter that is to execute some or what's called cognitive flexibility and, and go through cognitive reframing. And the simple way to do that is just stop and ask, what's another way to look at this? Okay. All right, that's my podcast, right? I mean, different that's perspectives. Right. Yeah, yeah. Different perspectives, right? So, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching some of these concepts to younger people, to my students, um, what I have them do is is basically do a sketch, right? Whatever it might be, but it's usually something that can sit on a table. So, say, uh, you know, like a glass or a coffee mug or or something like that, right? And they all sketch it out, and then I stop and say, okay, you know, like now do do another one, but do it creatively. Okay. And so they write, you know, world's greatest student and put, you know, polka dots on it, whatever yeah. it might be. 
I had them go around and look at all of them, and, and lo and behold, they are all drawn from the profile view, right? In four years of teaching this course, and few hundred students, I've had one kid draw from a bird's eye view. Huh. One kid, right? Remarkable. So my point to them is, we tend to look at things from one angle. And maybe you've seen the, you know, the famous video about inattentional blindness where uh, two groups are passing a basketball yes. and a gorilla walks through, right? That's, that, that's the phenomenon. Like we miss the gorilla, right? We, we, we focus so intently on one aspect of the reality that a lot of times we completely blind ourselves to other equally valid truths. And if we can select and elect to live in those truths, which are equally valid, we can maybe shift some of the emotional responses, right? And this is cognitive reframing. So a famous study, um, you know, of uh, Olympic athletes, right, and counterfacting. So this, this study showed that the bronze medalists tend to look and report being happier than the silver. And essentially what happened is once the results were complete, right, it's not like before they were saying, oh, I really hope I get third place instead right. of second. But once the bad happened, it's here. It's done, it has arrived. How are you going to view it, right? Like the coffee cup, mm -hmm. what perspective are you gonna to take towards it that is going to create the best outcome? And the bronze medalist looked at it as, I almost didn't make the podium. Yeah, yeah. And relative to that, I'm feeling really good about life. And silver looked at it as, I didn't get gold. And relative to that, I'm not feeling so good about life. Right. So going back to gratitude, what is that doing? That's that's pausing to see the good. Right. And again, so many people are dealing with so many difficult things right now. So I don't want to be insensitive to that because, uh, in fact, when I come back to your original question, let's say this first. Number one, feel what you got to feel. Don't just try to push it away. Okay. Right? We're sitting here talking about positive psych, and that's great, but what did I tell you? Like Negative emotions, negative experiences, um, they, they build us, they can make us stronger. It's important to acknowledge what you're feeling. And if you try to pretend that a negative emotion is not there, right, empirically speaking, we, we then magnify it, we make it worse, right? Yeah. So feel what you gotta feel. I'm not saying don't feel what you gotta feel. Okay? There's realities everyone's dealing with, but, Number two then, that, that one step, right, that go walk around the block step, is to just stop and say, what's another way to look at this? Okay, okay. yeah, I'm stuck inside all day, that really stinks, um, but I'm healthy, you know? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I lost work, um, for now I can put food on the table, okay? Um, I can't put, you know, uh, food on the table the same way I used to, um, but I'm, I'm still surviving and my friends are okay, right? Find some of those silver linings. Find some of those silver linings. Right? For, for the most part, I think they're out there. But again, you know, want to be sensitive to what people are dealing with. Yeah, I think they are. And I think that, um, you know, this is just something that's come up over and over and over. I've, I've interviewed so many people in this podcast. It's really fun to have this, this um, platform. Um, people who have been through just tremendous hardship, just unbelievable hardship. The podcast I did a couple of ep um, episodes ago with Nita, Melvin, and Sydney. I mean, the stories that they have been through is just, I mean, it's, it's like shocking. I mean, Sydney, mm -hmm. in one year, he lost his legs. They, they had a miscarriage, he and his wife, and he didn't get his dream job in one year. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then it's just like, he just was just like, well, but I do have this, I do have this, I do have this. And his mindset, I mean, he's just such a strong-minded person that he was just able to see it. And, you know, and some people that might come easier than others, maybe it's easier for Sydney to, sure. uh, to sure. view things like that, but it's possible for all of us. Like, I will never be as good at basketball as LeBron, but I can be better. It's a Carol Dweck thing, right? Like growth oh, mindset. I can become better at basketball than I am today and it might be easy for people like that one kid you said in four years who drew it from a bird's eye view maybe it just that's the way that that kid's brain just works and yep. but if you actively try to do this you can become better you might never be lebron but you can be better than you were yesterday that's right 
That's right. Yeah. And when, when I teach, well, one of the things that I teach, uh, I'm fortunate enough to be colleagues with uh, Dr. Karen Rivich, who's the director of resilience training at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll just mention right now, she's made her resilience course on Coursera free to the public. Uh, during this whole quarantine. So, uh, you know, your listeners want to check that out. She's fantastic. Yeah. She's one of the, you know, the world leaders in, in resilience, the, the skill and, and um, behaviors that allow you to bounce back from adversity, from difficult stuff. Um, and what, one of those things I just mentioned, right, what's another way to look at it? That's kind of one of those tricks is sort of cognitive, um, sort of cognitive reframing. But, you know, one of the things she lays out in her book, The Resilience Factor, is that, uh, and she's, she's co-written co that with uh, Dr. Andrew Chate, they mentioned that, you know, there's, the, the research suggests that there's not really a limit, I think, to how resilient we can become. Like, these are things that can be built, right? And, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's as simple as referring to something like neuroplasticity, but we know the brain can be changed, right? And we can change it. Uh, anyone who's ever learned to do anything has changed their own brain on some level, right? And rewired it. And, uh, you know, so that's another, by the way, way to look at this sort of whole experience in quarantine. It's like, it's, it's practiced, right? It's, it's building, um, if, if we're, as long as we're fortunate to come through, right, with our friends and family intact, um, you know, knowing the severity of this, uh, it's, it's only going to be strengthening. Right? And it's only going to be practice for difficult things later on in life that will inevitably continue to happen. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, this, is, this is just such good stuff that I think typically, you said you, you teach an independent school. I mean, this kind of information was not given to me in high school. I've taught at <laughs> several different public schools uh, in Pennsylvania and in LA, and this is not something that is widely taught in the educational system. Um, wh why is that? And also like, like, is, don't you, I mean, obviously you do, but we need to promote that this kind of stuff, like how to see things from another point of view and critical thinking and challenging yourself and, and understanding the way your brain works is just not promoted enough in education. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that in general? And, and do you know, do you know of any like, like formal actions to try to implement this in the educational system or anything? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So essentially, you know, we, we talked at the start a little bit about what I do and, and the, the institute that we're looking to run and the movement that we're kind of a part of is what's referred to as positive education. <clears throat> which again, not necessarily the greatest name, right. but the, the simple idea here is it's education fused with positive psychology, right? So this includes all sorts of, of skills like emotional intelligence, uh, cognitive reappraisal and reframing, um, understanding engagement and flow, motivation, habits, uh, resilience skills, like you just said, stuff that people need to use to be their best selves, right? And uh, what positive education tries to do is essentially establish um, kind of a four phase model, uh, which this, this typically gets promoted by the, the global leader in positive education, which is, uh, I would argue, Geelong Grammar School in Melbourne, Australia. Okay. But sort of the academic leaders would mostly be uh, in the University of Pennsylvania's Positive Psychology Center, and then obviously smattered around it at other universities, right? There's a lot of people interested in this area. Uh, but this four, four phase model uh, is, um, let me make sure I get it in the right order here, but uh, learn, live, teach, embed. So all stakeholders in an educational organization, institution, and I would argue community, right? I think that's a critical piece here. The parents and alumni and board need to be involved as well. Um, they first learn some of the principles of positive psychology. They learn how to sort of uh, amplify uh, and actualize some of their own potential, right? And build some of uh, more meaning and happiness into their own lives. It then gets built into teaching practice, into grading practice, into policies and procedures. Um, ideally, it then fuses a little bit with positive organizational systems, which is a really cool new-ish field, which is basically pos-psych and organizational psych. 
uh, fascinating. If you're if you've looked at like any sort of Adam Grant sort yeah, of stuff, like he even does some teaching. I think at UPenn's Positive Psych Center now, uh, maybe with their master's program. I'd have to double check, but you know, it's all kind of pointing in the same direction. It's like how do we how do we get the best out of people? Oh yeah, we make them happy and we find ways to like do it nicely and organically. We we create win wins, right? And so that's the idea, at least, you know, and I think in my head behind positive education and, you know, uh, one way to answer your question, too, is the U.S. is just behind, right? We're just slow in this because we, let's be frank, we have some really archaic views on, on how to kind of pull the best out of human beings, especially our young people. We also don't fund education very well, right? We could go on and on and on yeah. about that. But at a school like mine, uh, you know, I think at a school like yours, like we, we can take advantage of some of these things and some core needs are addressed. So you can start to look at things from the perspective of like a Maslow and an Alderfer's needs pyramid. And you say, most of our kids don't have to worry much about those existence needs. So what does it look like when we tap into the other needs? Can we build PERMA, right? What does that do for test scores? What does that do for compassion? What does that do for bullying? What does that do for motivation and entrepreneurship and ingenuity and all the maker space and innovation, right? And I think those of us in the field believe that when, when you can sort of teach people uh, individually and embed organizationally and systemically a lot of these ideas and skills and principles, you create exemplary ecosystems, right? And I think, that's, I think that's sort of the idea behind positive education. How do you build exemplary ecosystems that also happen to be producing, hopefully, yeah. you know, happy, compassionate, uh, citizenship-oriented, right, thriving human beings? Um, yeah, Nick, I love, like, again, I, I'm right there with you. I despise the name positive psychology. The way you explained it <laughs> of focusing on building the good, not fixing the bad is such an awesome way. I love that. Like, that's like the best. And, and by the way, you should do both though, right? I mean, both are critically sure. important. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. It's not, it's not one, they're not mutually exclusive by any means sure. for sure. But, but I do think that there is more in the education system and working with Heterodox Academy and a bunch of K through 12 teachers around the country is there is a big push um, I talk about it on this podcast all the time of like the, the social justice kind of advocacy is all about the, the racism and the patriarchy and all that kind of stuff. We don't have to get into it, but it's a lot about fixing all the bad in society. And I think that the balance is off. There's so much about what's terrible in society and what's, and what needs to get fixed, what needs to get fixed, what needs to get fixed. And I, I I'm right there with you. There are things that need to get fixed, but not enough. For these kids, and I taught in really bad neighborhoods in LA, there's not enough of like, look at all the, be the wonderful things you have. And that can be done in a way where kids just take a step back and they go, you know what? Yeah, I do have a grandma who loves me. And you know what? Yeah, I do have a good group of friends. And, I, you know, and that kind of stuff, just like gratitude journals, is almost mm -hmm. like viewed by some as like an insult. Like, how dare you tell these kids to be to be happy with what they have and just just take what you have and be happy with it and be satisfied like that's not what you're saying that's not what i'm saying that's right there's, yeah. there's a difference between gratitude and satisfaction yeah yeah you know, there, there's a key difference between those things and when we talk about the gratitude journal we talk about a, an attitude of gratitude or a grateful disposition or an otherwise a sense of optimism right that there's good things in life that are worth paying attention to and that's a signal that other good things can come right Absolutely. to be optimistic about that that does not mean that everything's hunky-dory that doesn't mean that we just look at the world through rose-colored glasses and pretend that we're just satisfied with the way things are it just means it's in our interest to slow down and take a little time to notice the good and it's worth mentioning too well like we didn't talk about it but you know many of your listeners might have already been aware of this but the negativity bias right human beings are inherently negative right it's an evolutionary tool we have to have it but unfortunately, what does that mean? It's easy to notice the bad stuff. We have to practice and slow down and be more intentional about noticing and savoring the good. And that's one more reason why you would practice something like a gratitude journal, right? It's slowing down and practicing seeing the good. Yeah, I've heard like a story, I don't know if it's true, it's like an urban legend of Steve Martin was performing stand-up and there was a huge sold-out crowd. And he looked at the crowd, everyone's laughing, but one guy was like stone-faced, not laughing, and that's why he quit stand-up. I know like I've had 
decent success as a teacher over 15 years. And I've had a lot of just really kind, you know, students, very encouraging students come out and say like, you know, you were a great teacher. You helped me with this, you helped me with this. And I've had like very few, like a handful of students just like, you were terrible and you ruined this or you ruined that. And I remember them so well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just the way that we are. Because it's I just a mechanism. You have, you have to pay attention yeah. to that. Right? Like, that's, that's, that's a social saber tooth tiger, right? If you don't pay attention to right. that and adjust and it happens enough, you're going to lose your job. Yeah. Right? You it's better to, to say that. Yeah. It's better to say that snake is poisonous. So I'm going to focus on that than be like, most snakes are fine. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. But right. applying, it's just, it sucks that we focus so much on the negative. But again, knowing psychology and no so you can wreck when that happens to me now i go i know what you're doing brain i see the shenanigans you're up to i'm not gonna let it win there are a lot of positive things that i go back to um review like emails i've gotten from students that were very positive and i try to like actively fight against that negative creep that that negative bias and by the way, that's also one of the skills that uh, Dr. Karen Rybich mentions in her book and in that, that course that I mentioned on Coursera is so you've got to challenge those beliefs with evidence, right? Yeah. A lot of times there's evidence for multiple beliefs. And when there is evidence for multiple beliefs, we get to choose mm -hmm. right? if we can have enough sort of cognitive control to make that choice. So right? it's, it's the glass half full, glass empty piece, right? And, yeah. and sometimes you got to see it both ways. Like the truth is that uh, you know, the research I'm aware of, the people who are, are typically the healthiest and most successful, a lot of psychologists would tell you, are people who can, can experience the bad, can experience the good, and are emotionally agile. Yeah, emotionally agile. That's a great, that's a great term. Um, so just to get people kind of out there and say, all right, you know what? I'm going to learn about this stuff. I'm going to learn about how my brain works. I'm going to try because... You want to get better at anything. You want to learn how to juggle. You got to pick up those, those little bean bags and start, and you're going to have to drop a lot, but there has to be some sort of action to be taken. You're not, if you are filled with anxiety, you're filled with like, you have a lot of depression going on right now and, you know, seek medical, medical help and professionals and all that kind of stuff um, for sure. But for what the act, you have to be willing to take on some action. So you mentioned that there's some resources and stuff like that. Yeah. Where would be a yeah. good place for people just to start? For those of you listening or just like, all right, all right, I'll try, I'll start somewhere. I'll, you know, essentially walk around the block. What are some places that people can start? And then also I wanna hear about how people can reach out to you as well. Sure, sure, good. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's so many resources out there, but to your point, right, uh, I'm not a therapist, uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist, right? I'm not an expert in depression, anxiety, and, and mental illness and things like that. So like you said, you know, if, you're, if you are really struggling with this and experiencing what you believe to be symptoms of depression or, or extreme anxiety, please reach out to, to licensed mental health professionals. Right? 100%, yeah. If you are looking for tools that empower you to try and look at things from a different angle, and a lot of people out there are, the first place I would look is again on Coursera in a, a course called The Science of Wellbeing offered by Yale professor, Dr. Lori Santos. So a quick pause psych history, right? Pause psych starts around like 1998. Uh, by the early 2000s, it's being offered at Harvard and it quickly becomes the most popular course ever offered at Harvard. Right? Within, I don't know, five, 10 years of that, Yale starts offering a class taught by Dr. Santos and it quickly becomes the most popular course ever offered at Yale. I believe Dr. Santos has to rent out a Yale concert hall or something crazy like that and give a lecture to about 1,200 students every week that first year or two. Uh, point is, it's an immensely popular course and uh, it is free during this quarantine time on course era, uh, the science of well being. And she'll take you through a lot of the principles of positive psychology, a lot of the exercises that you can do. And she has a workbook and assignments that are essentially quote unquote rewiring exercises, which speak to sort of the overlap between pause psych and uh, neuroplasticity. Okay. okay. The other resource I already mentioned is that free course from Dr. Karen Rivich on resilience uh, during difficult times. That's also on Coursera. Um, 
If you are more of the podcast type or the reading type, uh, I'll mention three podcasts. So if you want to look at sort of positive organizational systems and organizational psych side, if you want to think about how this might be impacting work, right, especially if you're a leader uh, or in maybe a middle management position, check out a podcast called Work Life by Adam Grant and Ted. Uh, Adam's about six years in a row, the most popular professor at the Warren Business School. He's terrific. He's got great stuff. And that yeah. podcast is awesome. Making Positive Psychology Work with Michelle McQuaid is terrific. It's all about positive psych in general, but also in the context of work. And then there's a Be Positive Psychology podcast. Um, books, Flourish by Martin Seligman is terrific. The Resilience Factor by Dr. Karen Rivich speaks to those skills that you would learn in the course. Uh, emotional, and uh, excuse me, uh, Permission to Feel by Dr. Mark Brackett, which is all about emotional intelligence. He's the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And then the last one I might mention is called The Upside of Stress by Dr. Kelly McGonigal. It's all about how stress is often subject to what's called the expectancy theory and that the effect we expect is often the effect we get. So there are certain studies that show that uh, people's mindsets about stress actually changes the biology of it and turns it into something very uh, enhancing and, and um, amplifying, right? Simple way to think of it is like when you procrastinate and that stress finally arrives the night before, it enhances motivation and enhances focus, Yeah. right? Yeah. That, that's amplifying, right? And there are ways to sort of harness that, right? So during a stressful time, uh, Kelly could probably have some great tips and tricks in her book. That's, that's awesome. So what I'm going to do is, um, cause there's a lot there and I was kind of writing it down. And I was like, that's a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that section out for you listeners. I'm going to put it on my Instagram and then, um, that'll be on my post, uh, for this, for this podcast with Nick, I'm going to, uh, have that be like something on the post. I'm just going to play that audio so you can go back on the Instagram and, and, and listen to all of that and write it down and, and go look for those resources. So thank you for that, for all of those resources for people. Some of those are linked to you. If you had mentioned my materials as well. Yes. Some of those are linked to my website. So if your listeners want to contact me, my website is www.udimonics.org. That's E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-C-S.org. And they can email me at nick at udimonics.org. Or, you know, you can try to DM me on Instagram. My handle is at Dr. Nick Holton. H-O-L-T-O-N. Yeah. Um, Nick, this was great. Thank you, sir. This is like this is a lot of fun. This, Thanks for having me. This is one of those things where just like, I want to talk about this enough that everyone who listens is just going to get annoyed and, and like, and just go like, all right, it just starts to creep in because you just hear it over. And that's what it is with me is like, it just kind of naturally becomes just a part of your thinking. You know, it becomes like kind of instinctual. You're kind of getting new, better instincts after talking about this stuff and hearing it over and over and over sure. again. So I really appreciate sure. you, you know, breaking it no, down. No, this was a lot of fun. I'm, yeah. I'm happy I could help. So 